Okay, let's uh, get ready and get started. Good morning, everybody. So welcome to Dickinson College. Uh, this is our Saturday morning teacher workshop. So uh, I wanted to take a few minutes at the outset just to kind of explain what we're doing. This is part of a long-range plan. Um, it's been 10 years since we've started the House Divided Project at Dickinson. It's designed to be a multimedia effort, create 21st century tools to bring the 19th century to life, college students and college faculty building resources free, uh, easily accessible, mostly aimed at high school students or middle school students or introductory college level classes as a way to bring to life the period. We're focused on what we call the House Divided Era, 1840 to 1880. We've built a research engine online. I hope some of you have used it. I know some of you have been involved in our workshops and our programs before. Um, we have now 15,000 public domain images online at this research engine, and we've got you know, tens of thousands of records. It's a wide-ranging, unfinished project. Uh, it will continue to evolve and grow. Along the way, we've built like two dozen different websites around it designed to support different topics uh, in a more teachable fashion. So we've got um, a, a website devoted to Lincoln's writings. Uh, it's 150 of Lincoln's most teachable documents with all kind of supporting resources, close reading videos, maps, images, documents. Uh, we've got some teachers here who've worked on this project in the past. Uh, teachers who participated in one of our online courses. We have an online graduate course with the Gilder Lehrman Institute called Understanding Lincoln. They become contributing editors to this website. Sometimes their students contribute content to, their, to this website. It's one of the websites that's featured in your program. We've got a list of House Divided websites that we're promoting as kind of very teachable resources. This is one of our platforms up here. It's Civil War and Reconstruction Online. This is what I'm gonna use today to show you how I use this kind of resource to teach with my students. I'll kind of model it. Uh, I'll walk you through it in a minute, but I just wanted you to know that what we're doing here today is part of this sort of three-day conference on Reconstruction that we're sort of sponsoring as a way to celebrate our anniversary. Of course, it's the 150th anniversary of Reconstruction. That's not a cause necessarily for celebration. Reconstruction is such a mixed era. There was success and failure. Eric Foner kicked us off by reminding us all about that. He calls it the unfinished revolution. Uh, and he emphasizes that it's not a total failure, and it wasn't a failure for the way that the older generations of Americans described it, uh, but it was a failure because it didn't live up to the promises of equality that the Civil War suggested, at least by the end of the conflict. Uh, and then yesterday, here at Dickinson, we had a presentation, a conversation with Jeffrey Rosen, who's head of the National Constitution Center. They're one of our partners here as well. In your bags, you got materials from NCC. I don't know if you've been there. I think most people have, but it is a, it's a real palace. I, I told that to Jeff when he was here. And he's committed completely to trying to make it more of an educational resource online. So he's launched this second founding initiative. He wants people to teach the reconstruction of the Constitution as being almost equal to importance to the first founding, the 1787 convention. And he's devoting more space to this in the National Constitution Center, and they're doing more work online. And I am totally committed to this idea. In particular, uh, one of the things that I think we should be doing in the classroom is showing our students who the founders of the reconstructed constitution were. I asked him yesterday, you know, who were the founding fathers of the reconstructed constitution? Who was the James Madison? And he said John Bingham was the James Madison of the reconstructed constitution. And you know, I don't know if you know much about John Bingham, but he's a relatively obscure figure today. Very few of our students have ever heard of him. I teach him in my classes, but I'm trying to promote the idea, and so is Jeff, that all of us should be teaching these figures. We should bring to life some of these characters. And then, of course, today, we're doing this workshop. And you know, I'm really excited about that. So I'm going to walk you through some of what we're doing about reconstruction. And then, later this morning, you're going to get a presentation from Greg Downs. Gregory Downs is a professor at the University of California, Davis. Uh, he has written this book. It's kind of a groundbreaking study uh, called After Appomattox. And it's one of a new generation of scholars. So Eric Foner wrote the kind of standard 
narrative of Reconstruction, the one that's emerged in the last uh, 30 years as the major interpretation of the period. But uh, Greg's book, After Appomattox, argues that uh, there is uh, a story that Foner's book didn't cover in detail that really matters, and that's about congressional war powers and the use of those war powers through the vehicle of the army to spread freedom and try to preserve it in the face of Southern resistance. And he's built a website around this book. And so um, what makes that especially useful for us is the website's free. Uh, and it's very usable, it's a GIS project. So he's gonna show you how to teach some of the insights that are in the book. If you wanna buy a copy of the book, Jim Schmick from Civil War and More is here. Uh, he's offering a discounted copy of this book for educators, uh, and he takes credit cards, so that's even better. Uh, and then Greg will be happy to sign these books. Greg is gonna present at 1045, and then we're gonna have a lunch break. During the lunch break, you can, uh, of course, eat. I would suggest that. Uh, we have a map in your folder that tells you where to go. I sent that over email as well. Uh, but um, carve out some time to come over to our new gallery, our studio at 61 Northwest Street. We've been around for 10 years, but this is the first time we've ever had a a large physical space. We used to have a, a little corner office in the basement. I wouldn't invite you know, more than two of you in there at one time. But now we have this relatively interesting big space that we've used to create a kind of augmented reality studio, a multimedia production facility, a kind of demonstration classroom. This is where I'm gonna be teaching. Uh, most of my smaller classes, and it's got like museum style exhibits, but they're augmented with um, a device called Orasmo, which is a, an app from Hewlett Packard. It's free. And what happens is when you point a device at these museum style exhibits, it recognizes the pictures and cues up websites, videos, multimedia content. It's really cool. But here's the best thing for you. I'm going to make all of the exhibits in the gallery free downloadable PDFs. If you wanted to, you could put them up in the bulletin board around your room, download the free app or asthma, follow the House Divided channel, and then recreate the museum in your own classroom. And if you were interested, the learning curve is very low. You could actually have your students see the models in front of them of like what college students and professional historians did, and then they could build their own exhibits that are versions of these things, but maybe connected to your communities. So I think it's a way to get our students thinking about how history is more than just a five paragraph essay or a term paper, but how it can be a museum experience, a historic site experience, a public history engagement. You know, one of the challenges of a period like Reconstruction is it, it, it can get bewildering and boring to a lot of students. So we wanna to try to humanize it, bring it to life. That's what I'm gonna to try to show you today. Okay, and then when we're all done with this workshop, um, after Ann Rubin presents after lunch, and Ann Rubin, by the way, uh, is as good a digital historian in this country as exists. I mean, she was there at the beginning of the Valley of the Shadow project. I think most of you are aware of this. It's probably the premier digital project in the historical world in the country. It came out of the University of Virginia. Ann Rubin helped develop that. She's now a professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore campus. Uh, and she's done a website and a book about Sherman's March. Through the Heart of Dixie is the name of her book, and her website is um, uh, called shermansmarch.org. So she's gonna show you how to teach Sherman's March and the evolution of it in American memory using her very interesting graphic website. And just like Greg Downs, her book is here. Jim Schmick in the back has it at a discount for educators, and she's happy to sign it as well. Uh, my book is back there as well. I'm happy to sign if you buy a copy. Um, and of course, you also all received Eric Foner's book, signed already in advance. And so, uh, you know, we want to try to get teachers using books, using websites, and then teaching the latest insights from these scholarships. That's part of the long-range plan of the House Divided Project. Uh, but the other part of this long-range plan is that we're going to take the material from this week We've got all of these presenters that I just described doing video interviews, and we've got uh, all of the clips from the presentations that are being streamed live over YouTube. We're actually being streamed right now over YouTube. Uh, and 
we're going to have all of those videos available online after the fact. They'll all be archived on the web. And we're going to create a new digital classroom on reconstruction. It'll be one of our featured websites. My interns have been working hard on that. They've created a map uh, from Eric Foner's book. Uh, we're going to be doing social annotations on genius.com for reconstruction era documents. Uh, we have uh, a network of images. You know, I said the Lincoln's Writings website has 150 of Lincoln's most teachable writings. What we've decided to do for the Reconstruction website is identify 150 most teachable images from Reconstruction. I think images are a really underused resource in teaching, and now with digital tools, we can do some interesting things with them. So I'm going to show you some of the images that are going to be in that website today and how I would teach them. Okay? And I'm going to do that from this platform. This is the Reconstruction uh, online course platform that we built in partnership with Gilder Lehrman. Uh, but I should say this, so um, if anybody's watching live on YouTube, we're uh, happy to take comments and questions over the live chat. If you're watching it on the YouTube channel, you can do that. If you want to ask a question on Twitter, you can do that with a Reconstruction 150 hashtag. The interns are up in the control room furiously managing all this. Uh, if you guys have questions, this is, this is informal. It's a teacher workshop, so you can interrupt and ask them, although I do have... Um, I should have a microphone here. If I don't find it this morning, we'll have it for Greg Downs' session. But feel free to ask a question at any point, and we'll be happy to um, you know, take whatever comments or questions that you have. So before I get started, does anybody have a quick opening question? All right, so this is, this is like our basic online Civil War and Reconstruction platform. Let me show you some of these tools. Okay, So the course syllabus has a coming of the war, why they fought, emancipation, home front, and reconstruction platform. It's got, in these platforms, short videos that I've done, like on Dred Scott. Dred Scott might be the best known name about the associated case. with American In this slavery. case, it's a focus on Harriet Scott more than Dred Scott. We had a teacher workshop here a few years ago that was a revelation for me. A professor uh, from... Uh, the University of Iowa Law School, Leah Vanderveld, has done some remarkable work with freedom suits. This is a, an image from her work. This looks like a quilt, but it turns out these are, does anybody know what these are? Can anyone guess? These are signatures from freedom suits by slaves like Dred and Harriet Scott who filed for their freedom in the state of Missouri. All of the 300 freedom suits that we have on record from the state of Missouri are digitized and available free online. And she created a kind of modern day quilt out of this. This is a really powerful thing. Uh, and I'll show you some of this in our augmented reality studio, but this is one of the best stories of all. Thank you. Uh, and we have this in part of our coming of the war story. In our uh, classroom, we also have the uh, Gettysburg virtual tour. This is something we built with Gilder Lehrman. It's a video tour of Gettysburg in one hour, divided up into stops, where I talk about issues like Amos Humiston, the private who had a picture of his three children on him when he died, but no other identification, and they used the picture of the children to identify him. It was one of the most powerful and poignant stories of the war. Very few people have heard of it today, but it's one of the more teachable stories. And then I have a, a segment at the cemetery where I talk about um, the story of Samuel Wilkerson and Bayard Wilkerson. Sam Wilkerson was the New York Times reporter. Bayard Wilkerson was a young kid who died on the first day of the battle. Their family story is one of the origins of a phrase that was in the Gettysburg Address. And I have the whole story told at the studio. And it's also part of a Google exhibit that we did on the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. So that's something that we have featured here. And then I have um, a bunch of information on the web about digital tools and web guides, and we have um, discussion posts from teachers who have participated in our work. A lot of the teachers have been interested in um, documents and lesson plans and also word clouds, uh, word clouds around subjects like um, uh, 
uh, Civil War era topics uh, using Tagcedo or Wordle. And so they, they talk about the process of making these more teachable tools. And then I have this section on reconstruction. I have a video about the Frederick Douglass speech in 1876 where he calls Lincoln the white man's president. That was a powerful moment. But what's really powerful is that in 1865, at a speech in New York, uh, at the beginning of June, he said Lincoln was the black man's president. So in 1865, Frederick Douglass calls Lincoln the black man's president, and in 1876, at the dedication to the Freedmen's Monument, he calls him the white man's president. And I think that's the most teachable thing of all in a history class. You tell your students he seems to have changed his mind, and yet Lincoln's dead the whole time. So what changed? And of course, the answer I'm looking for is it's Reconstruction that changed. It wasn't Lincoln that changed. It was what happened, what happened around and in the aftermath of Lincoln's death. And for Douglas, it was a, a bitterness that was creeping in uh, and a change in focus. Uh, and I describe all that in this teaching video. And then I, I do featured images. And here I've got um, a post about images from the Civil War era. This is a famous one on the net. Uh, one of the things I do in my classes is I talk about, um, I've used a book by Louis Mazur called Civil War Concise History in a bunch of different classes. I find it really readable and short and usable. Uh, and in the end of his book, he describes how it's kind of remarkable that at the end of the war, the very end of the war, the Confederates actually began to initiate a policy to enlist black soldiers. They debated whether or not to offer them freedom for fighting, for the Confederacy, but um, at the very end of the war, in desperation, they began to initiate this policy. And of course, that has triggered um, a number of controversies over the years. There's a debate among neo-Confederates and historians over to what extent there were, quote, black Confederates. There were black men who followed the Confederate armies as slaves, coerced labor. I mean, the Confederate army couldn't operate without slaves. We always say Lee brought 75,000 men to Pennsylvania, but he actually brought, brought closer to 85,000 men to Gettysburg. 10,000 of them were slaves. Teamsters, servants, and others providing the labor for the army. Uh, they weren't combatants. But at the end of the war, they were talking about combatants. And sometimes on the web, there are neo-Confederates who argue that there were black men who fought voluntarily for the Confederates, the black Confederates. And they show this picture as an example. First Louisiana Native Guard, the Louisiana free blacks who fought for the Confederacy. Has anybody seen this picture on the web? Does this look familiar to you? If you start looking for it, you'll find it. Now, here's the thing. That picture is doctored. It's photoshopped. This is the actual picture. It shows a Union Army officer to the left. And you realize that even though um, those uniforms look perhaps West Point gray, those were black men who were being trained in the Union Army in Cheltenham, Pennsylvania at Camp William Penn in 1864. This is their training photo. And so you can see the cropping that's being done and how misleading it is. I mean, one of the things we have to do in the digital age is we have to help our students see through falsehoods and credibility issues and weighing sources online is a lot trickier than it looks, I mean, especially with the manipulation of images. Now, this wasn't just something that happened back then. This is an image that we use a lot at House Divided. Are people familiar with this one? Have you seen this? It's a very famous print that was issued at the end of the war, Emancipation. It's celebrating Emancipation, it was actually published by King and Baird, printers in Philadelphia in 1864. It shows Lincoln at the center. On the left, you see life before slavery. On the right, you see life after emancipation. By the way, if you click on this image, it'll take you into the House Divided Research Engine. This is the actual research engine. And what's nice about this for presentation purposes is we have the ability to zoom in and out very easy so you can see details, especially in those period cartoons, that's really helpful. Okay, so this is all clickable straight from the post. But that was a doctored image. The original illustration appeared in January 1863 um, in uh, Harper's Weekly by Thomas Nass, the famous cartoonist. Uh, and it was different. Does anybody see the difference besides the color? What's different? Lincoln is missing in the original image from the center circle. Uh, they added him in 1865. 
Now, here's the question. What's teachable about that? I mean, sorry. Take a second and think about that. Lincoln's missing from the 1863 image, and he's added to the 1865 image produced after his assassination. What would you want your students to say about that? Does anybody want to volunteer? Al. Who was responsible for the emancipation? Right. And so what's the implication in 1863 the way Nass drew it? Right, maybe Lincoln wasn't such a great emancipator. Other people were involved, or it's a bigger issue than just him. By 1865, after he's dead and he's a martyr for freedom, maybe he, this is part of the um, transformation of Lincoln into this legendary figure. While he was alive, he wasn't such a uh, hero. After he was dead, he becomes a secular saint. This is one way you could show that. You know, of course, Thomas Nass is not anti-Lincoln. He doesn't think the slaves just freed themselves. But clearly, in the middle of the war, Lincoln wasn't necessarily the same revered icon that he was after his assassination and that he's become now. And, you know, there's a whole host of factors that go into the Emancipation Policy. Congressional Confiscation Acts, contraband issues, slaves freeing themselves, military decrees, emancipation itself. Lincoln writes three different versions of the Emancipation Proclamation. It evolves. But you know, our students don't remember much of that. And we have to figure out a way to convey the complexity of it. And so sometimes it might actually be easier to convey it with an image, a compare and contrast like that. Now let me pause. Does anybody want to make a comment or ask a question? Has anybody used this image in class? Have you, did you know the original? Yeah. Now, you know what's interesting for me? I used this image in my classes for years without knowing the original, and I had it in our own research engine, okay? It's not like I wasn't aware that Thomas Nast did this cartoon, but I never paid enough attention. The color version was always better to teach. I didn't look at it. I'm doing one of these things at a workshop with Gilder Lamron in New York, and one of the teacher participants is doing a project, you know, for the, the end of the week presentation, and she points this out. And so, uh, you know, that's just close reading of an image. And ever since then, you know, I've benefited from that. It's like Leah Vanderveld, working on freedom suits, figured out that it was Harriet Scott more than Dred Scott who was behind their joint freedom suit. They both filed in 1846. When you pay attention to detail, sometimes it can yield really rich insights. And so I've been benefiting from that ever since. Did somebody else have a comment over here? Yeah, go ahead. It looks like an angel freeing a baby. So, you know, Al said slaves freeing themselves. Thomas Nast probably would have put it as God, you know, the, the work of God. Now, by the way, they did bring down the microphone. And so uh, I'm going to ask you, I, I do want you to feel free to like give and take, so interrupt me. But when people talk, I'm going to try to pass around the microphone so that we can get it on the audio the right way, and it'll, it'll be preserved. So I'll just ask you to help me pass it when we get that. It'll just take a little bit of a delay. OK. Any other comments? Any other comments or questions? All right. So now look at this image here. Now, this is one of the images that I use uh, most frequently in my classes. It's a detail called the men of Company E. I have a video that describes this image. So a lot of what I'm doing today is I'm talking through a bunch of issues, and if you're interested in them and want to pursue them, I've got a lot of the material sort of prepared for flipped classroom style use in these short videos. In this case, it's a three-minute video describing the origins of this image. So this is what I do with it. Usually in my class, I'll put it up on the screen like this with numbers around those figures. Because what I love about this is you get enough detail um, from the faces that you can almost see their personalities. So I ask my students to like, either do a, just a brainstorming session or maybe a free writing session where they take one of those figures and they try to explain what was in his head. Like, what is he thinking? What does the photograph capture about his emotion? So, you know, number one, um, you know, what is, he, what is he worried about? What is he anxious over? Number two, what is he so thoughtful about? Number three, what is he so proud of? Number four, what's he angry about? Uh, number five, why does he look so pensive? Number six, you know, why is he so scared? 
Uh, and of course, you know, there's no right or wrong answer to this. We actually don't know their individual names. I mean, we know which unit this is, Company E, 4th United States Colored Troops, but we don't know them by name. I and mean, we have the regimental roster, but we can't identify them by the photograph. But you can start to identify something about these men. If you look carefully at this image, do a close reading of it, do you see any visual evidence that tells you at least something about their background? Does anybody see it? Just look up and down the different figures. You know, they're obviously... One's married. Number one has a wedding band on. Now that's what I try to get my students to see. No matter what age group you teach, eventually, if you hang in there long enough, they'll see the wedding band. And that's a, that's a powerful insight. Why is that such a powerful insight? Because, I mean, if you ask a black family what was the biggest contribution that the Civil War made to their lives, they would probably tell you legalizing our marriages, making our families legal and protecting them. For at least the former slaves, that was certainly it. Now, I don't know for sure. Number one might have been born free and never enslaved at all. I don't know. But a lot of the men in Company E were enslaved or had been, and so it's likely that he's a former slave who's now free and has a legal marriage. And it's certainly a good reminder to our students that it's one of the most powerful consequences of the war. Um, but when I get to number six, my students always start to speculate, why was he afraid? And of course, the answer they're going to give is he's afraid to go into battle. You know, he's, they look like fresh recruits, they have clean uniforms, and they must be scared about that. And we could talk about the 180,000 men that were enrolled into the Union Army and another perhaps 30 to 40,000 in the Navy. And, you know, we can talk about that process and how they made a critical difference in the last two years of the war. But it turns out that this is the glass negative showing the full unit, men of Company E. And then if you notice, there was writing at the top of the glass plate that was overlooked for years. But if you look carefully, it says this photograph dates from November 17, 1865. Okay, so now what's, what's important about that? It's two years after Gettysburg, and it's months after the end of the war. So these guys aren't afraid about going into battle. The lesson that I try to draw to my students is they're afraid about what happens after, after the war. This is a reconstruction photograph. This is a photograph about what happens to us in freedom and how are they going to be treated in a newly reconciled nation. Uh, will it be freedom and equality or freedom and second-class citizenship? Will they be unemployed and without protection or will they have jobs and opportunity? You know, they're, they're nervous, scared, pensive because of what happens next. And that's a great transition from one to the other with an image to do it. Now, does anybody want to make a comment or ask a question about that? Okay, now, I, this time I want to try to pass the mic. So if you don't mind. And when you get the microphone, could you just identify, you know, who you are and um, where you teach? It wasn't worth all that, but uh, <laughs> all right, give uh, it Bill, back. Bill Connors, I teach at St. Joe's Prep in Philadelphia, yeah. and I just also wanted to mention then November of '65. If if you're a if you're a former slave, the Thirteenth Amendment hasn't been ratified yet. Right. You right. might still you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, ratification is final in December, so we're weeks away from the final ratification of the amendment. While the microphone's out there, does anybody else want to make a comment or ask a question? All right, let's leave it there and we'll pass it when we get closer, okay? So let's go back here. Now, I have another image here that I use to teach. This is gonna be one of our featured images at the new website. All of the images that I'm showing you are. Um, but this one in particular, I, I've really enjoyed working with, and this is also over at the studio that you're going to see. You're going to see an exhibit based on this. This is um, a glass negative that's been damaged. That's what those black lines are. It's cracked. And it shows a very powerful moment that's not well known at all. This is the flag raising at Fort Sumter on April 14th, 1865. Now, does anybody know this moment? Does anybody teach this moment? 
The flag raising at Fort Sumter, in it, do you? Sorry? No, uh, the man who raises the flag over Fort Sumter in April 1865 for the Union is Robert Anderson, the man who surrendered the flag in April 1861. This is the Union's mission accomplished moment at the end of the Civil War. They have defeated uh, Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. There are still a few field armies out there fighting, but they've recaptured South Carolina. Uh, and they've recaptured Sumter, and they've invited a delegation of leading abolitionists and Union military officials and Robert Anderson to come back and pull that flag back up over Sumter. I don't know if you can tell from the distance shot, but um, this, the fort's been totally d destroyed by bombardments over the four years. This is a detail from that image. This is what I love about altering images in a positive way. Now, I don't know, can you, can you identify that man? He's not well known today, but um, that's Henry Ward Beecher in the white hat, standing there speaking. That's Harry Beecher Stowe's brother. He was the minister of the Plymouth Church, uh, the Congregational Church in Brooklyn that was like the hub of the Underground Railroad. He was one of the leading abolitionists of Northern society before the war and they invite him to give the sermon at the flag raising. And that's him speaking there uh, at about two o'clock in the afternoon on April 14th, 1865. And um, you mentioned Garrison. Originally, Garrison's biographers thought that he was seated right next to Beecher. They identified him as that man in the hat. Um, Garrison, of course, is the great abolitionist leader. Uh, you know, you may remember this. Garrison was the editor of The Liberator, and he was this fiery abolitionist in the 1830s, but already by the 1840s, he was marginalized in the anti-slavery movement. He represented a fringe, and a lot of the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionists splinter, and a lot of the political abolitionists resent him. They think of him as counterproductive, and he, he gets increasingly embittered and irrelevant, really. And then, of course, the Republican Party emerges in the 1850s, and they want nothing to do with him. And so he's sidelined. Uh, and he's not an influential figure in the anti-slavery movement, at least in the mainstream of the movement. But then during the Civil War, he has a kind of a comeback, because it takes him a while, but he decides that Abraham Lincoln is a, a real emancipationist, that you know, the emancipation is an abolition policy. And so he endorses Lincoln in 1864. Not all abolitionists did. Some of them refused until the last bitter moments of the 1864 campaign to support Lincoln. There was this movement to support John Fremont as a kind of third party candidate. But Garrison's with Lincoln. And so when they have this flag raising ceremony, this mission accomplished moment, they want Garrison there. And they have other leading abolitionists there. But that's not Garrison in that photograph. His biographers are wrong. Garrison is that guy seated in the hat at the far left in the pole. We are able to magnify this image even more. There's Robert Anderson seated right to the left of Beecher holding a, a, a stick. And John Nicolay, do you see him identified there in the center? That's the man Lincoln sent to represent him. They wanted Lincoln to come. Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, is the guy who organized this event. And he was um, convinced that both Lincoln and Stanton should go. But uh, Lincoln decided he couldn't take a trip that long away from Washington near the end of the war. So he was going to go to Richmond instead. Right? He went to Richmond right after Lee's army fled. And he was going to stay. And Stanton was going to go in his place. And then Seward got hurt in a carriage accident. And Stanton decided he couldn't go. So they sent Nicolay instead. And then the other men there that I've identified, George Thompson and Theodore Tilton are other leading abolitionists. They're not well known. I haven't identified all the people in this photograph, but I will tell you right now, I will pay money to any of you who can. Uh, there are women and men, and I know some of these people are famous. Um, some of them are obscure. The newspapers, by the way, reported that there were leading black figures in this crowd, like Robert Smalls, but I can't find any black figures in the crowd at all. And I'm curious why. I can't explain it yet. Frederick Douglass wasn't there. Um, he was invited but chose not to go. Uh, and that's a story that we explain in the studio across the street. Uh, 
this is another close-up from a different photograph in that series on April 14th of Garrison, standing by the pole right after the ceremony. I love this image. This is the end of the war, William Lloyd Garrison reflecting on what it all means right after he heard Henry Ward Beecher stand up there and announce in his sermon that he was speaking. This is Beecher saying this. He said, I'm speaking from the pulpit of the broken stone. That's Fort Sumter. And in that sermon, he said, you know, thank God that the president has kept his health for all of these four years. And he eventually came to describe how the abolitionists had questioned Lincoln's leadership, but ultimately he was right. You know, he had achieved the balance between union and freedom in the right way, and they, he had brought it home, and they had won the war, and they, had, they were abolishing slavery, and it was a wonderful moment. That was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Of course, you know what happens, right? 10 o'clock at night, Lincoln gets shot at Ford's Theater. So we have an exhibit about that. Now, that juxtaposition, I think, is really powerful. And I have hardly seen anybody, any textbook, ever make that connection and bring it home to people. But it brings home an awful lot. Now, does anybody want to ask a question or make a comment about that? One of the things Garrison did the next day is very revealing. So Saturday morning, April 15th, Garrison decides he wants to go visit the grave of John C. Calhoun. And so he takes a delegation of abolitionists. They go to see the grave of the leading secessionist, the sort of father of secession. And according to one of the people who was there, Garrison stands over the headstone and says, down into a deeper grave than this has slavery gone, and for it there will be no resurrection. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a moment of triumph for him. And what's powerful about that for me, and I wrote an essay about this, and it's part of the augmented reality in the exhibit that we have across the street. Um, not all abolitionists agreed with him. Okay, so Garrison at this moment is telling people, we can at least declare victory in our abolition struggle. And he's advocating that they shut down the American Anti-Slavery Society. They close their doors, declare victory, and move on to new fights. But some of the abolitionists in the movement said, we're not done yet. And one of them was Frederick Douglass. The reason why he wasn't there at Charleston in 1865 was because he was telling people, slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. That was the phrase he was using. He used that phrase at the annual meeting in the Anti-Slavery Society with Garrison sitting right there. And they were, you know, they've always had a, a contentious relationship. I mean, Garrison was once his mentor, but then they broke. They've reconciled a little bit since then, but now they're fighting again. And in May of 1865, Douglas stares Garrison down, joins with Wendell Phillips, another leading abolitionist, and they throw Garrison out as the head of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and they put Wendell Phillips in charge, and they announce that they're going to fight for equal rights, and they're going to keep moving in a civil rights direction. And that's, that's a really interesting, teachable moment. It's like, what does the end of the war mean? Is it the end of slavery? And how do we teach that? And what are the choices that people faced? And so this is a, a great way to teach it. Now, does anybody want to make a comment or ask a question about that? OK. So let me scroll down and show you another triumphant moment here. Does anybody know what this is? Can you recognize anybody in this crowd? So this is uh, uh, an illustrated scene from the uh, passage of the 13th Amendment <coughs> depicting January 31st, 1865 in the floor of Congress. This is like the Lincoln movie moment uh, showing Thaddeus Stevens shaking hands with two other congressmen. Thaddeus Stevens, of course, on the left. He's recognizable now when you see him blown up a little bit. Uh, and the other man that he's shaking, the man in the middle is William Kelly, a congressman from Philadelphia, kind of leading anti-slavery politician. And then John Creswell on the right. Now, John Creswell is totally obscure, uh, but he's important to us at Dickinson because he's a Dickinson College graduate. And uh, so that's why we've written an e-book about him. John Osborne, who's in the back of the room now, is the co-founder of this project. And Chris Bombaro, who's not here today, but she's been a leading figure in our project over the years, she and John wrote this ebook about um, 
Creswell that I think is an incredibly teachable story. So in your copy of the Foner book, you have a bookmark, a card, that shows you how to download this free ebook. John Creswell was like a democratic businessman from Maryland, slaveholding state, who uh, went to Dickinson and was a kind of standard issue conservative states rights Democrat through the secession crisis. And he doesn't believe in secession, like that's too extreme for him. So he becomes a unionist. And then over the course of the war, he gets radicalized and he becomes an emancipationist. He supports the emancipation policy. And then eventually he fights for abolition in Maryland. And you know, Maryland's the first state that votes to abolish slavery in the United States and does so in a popular referendum in 1864. And he's a leader in that. And then when it comes time for final passage of the 13th Amendment, he's the guy that Thaddeus Stevens chooses to lead the debate. That's why he's featured in this handshake moment in the foreground of that illustration from the newspaper. Now, he ain't in the Lincoln movie. Uh, we had earlier, um, Eric Foner was complaining about the Lincoln movie. He said the Vampire Slayer is a better movie. Uh, because it's, you know, the Lincoln movie is all fiction. And then Jeffrey Rosa was here Friday and he said, no, 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 the Lincoln movie is good. It takes a constitutional moment and treats it seriously. That's true. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, the Lincoln movie certainly isn't a textbook and it doesn't cover all of the details and it doesn't get the story of the debates, uh, uh, you know, in any kind of accurate way. And the debates actually begin with John Cresswell. And the reason for that is because he represents a slaveholding state that's abolished slavery on its own, and so he's a very powerful representative for this story. And then after the war, during Reconstruction, he becomes a postmaster general in General Grant's cabinet, a senator before that, and he is an integrationist. He integrates the Postal Service. He brings black men into the government, and he becomes a real civil rights leader in some respects. This is the story of how individuals can change their opinions. Remember I talked about Frederick Douglass, white man's president, black man's president. This is John Creswell. People change, right? That's one of the things we want to do in our classrooms is show our students how people change. And sometimes, you know, you need stories and images like this to help explain it. Now, does anybody have any questions or comments about that or about the 13th Amendment issue? Because we've raised that several times over our previous days, but uh, I'm the only speaker today who's going to focus on that. So does anybody want to talk about that amendment or the other related amendments? Can I, can I ask you a question? Are people using the Lincoln movie in their classroom as a teaching tool? Has, that, has anybody used it? I think it's a great teaching tool. Now, what we've done at House Divided Project in our Lincoln's writings uh, website is we've created a teacher's guide to the movie. So let me show you that now. I'm going to pull up that URL. Okay, so this is our website, Lincoln's Writings. Um, And by the way, this is, um, we have a bunch of projects here. Can't resist this, a little bragging. The first project that we have from one of our teachers is Jesse O'Neill's project on Lincoln's humor. It's a great project. Very well done website, and Jesse's here. So, you know, I would thank him for coming. Uh, but, you know, this is what we do, is we give a platform for teachers to build websites that then they can use in their own classroom or that we can share with other teachers in sessions like this so we can try to keep expanding the network of learning and sharing. All of this is free and freely available. What Jesse did was take a bunch of, um, you know, Lincoln letters, do close readings of them and emphasize the humor in them and sort of humanize Lincoln. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very you know, well done site. And one of our scholarly advisors, James Oakes, is part of the team that picked this as one of our winning prizes in the Understanding Lincoln course and that's why he, he comments on it here. And so I'm teaching the Understanding Lincoln course this summer, uh, again with Gilder Lehrman and registration opens next month. So those of you who haven't taken these courses, the Gilder Lehrman graduate program is fantastic. Uh, I know a number of you in this room 
have participated in it. They get some really good professors. In our case, I think this is just a really good topic. The Understanding Lincoln topic is just perfectly suited for the classroom, and we teach tools like Jesse built. I think Jesse could testify to this. He didn't know how to build a website before he took the course, and that website's pretty well done. So it's not that high of a learning curve. Um, so let me pull up the teacher's guide. Guide to Spielberg's Lincoln here. So this is an unofficial guide. We've got a cast of characters that shows the original uh, historic figures and then the actors who played them. And if you click on the links, it takes you into the research engine of the House Divided Project. So if you want to use the movie as a starting point for a little research project, this gives you context. We call it a research engine for a reason. I always tell my students there's a difference between search and research. So nowadays, you might as well forget the fact that they're going to start with a card catalog and a library. They're going to start with Google, OK? So you can't fight that, all right? But the way you can teach them to do better with Google is to recognize that Google and search yields hits, but research is about making connections. It's about going back and forth on the search. And so what they want to find are sites like mine or sites like Anne creates or like Greg has created or sites like the Valley of the Shadow that curate the information, provide context for it, and enable them to build from credible sources. So you have to train students to appreciate that. Okay. And then if we go back to the teacher's guide, we also have um, a long essay here on the examples of artistic license. So if you want to know the difference between the historical record and the movie, if you want to see where they made subjective interpretive leaps, this is a long essay that provides all those details and it's synchronized with the DVD. And we also, in speaking of that, we have a scene by scene summary and a link to the original written um, script. So sometimes this is the easiest way to teach a movie is to be able to pull up the script, okay? And so now you can access this online as well. So even though I, I'm critical of the movie, I would never say like Eric Foner did that the Lincoln Vampire Slayer movie is better. Uh, but even though I've been critical, I think it's really teachable. And I'm glad they made it and I use it in my classroom. Okay, before I go to my last image, is there anybody who wants to ask a question about anything I just covered? Okay, can you pass the microphone over? Uh, Nicole Ripper, West Catholic, Philadelphia. Um, going back to the Louisiana black soldier picture right. that we know is doctored, is that the, do we know what it's doctored from? Like, are they, when I, saw, when I saw you pull up the real image, my brain immediately went, okay, it's the 54th mass. Is that no, the no. group? Uh, I can't remember which unit it was. It's not the 54th. It's taken in 1864 at Camp William Penn. It, that was one of the leading um, uh, training facilities for black soldiers. There were dozens of regiments that passed through there. We could certainly figure it out or find out uh, right away. The link that I have under the photograph gives the full details behind the falsification and they'll identify the regiment for you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so let me bring this home and then we'll take a quick break and we'll hear from Greg Downs. I, um, believe it or not, I think in some ways, to me, this is one of the most teachable images of the Reconstruction era, even though it dates from January 1st, 1863, okay? So this is a great image. It's from January 1st, 1863. If you click on it, it takes you into our Emancipation Digital Classroom. It shows black troops celebrating Emancipation Day, the reading of Lincoln's Proclamation, although on January 1st in Port Royal, South Carolina, they can't read the actual Emancipation Proclamation. They have to read the September 22nd Proclamation because they haven't yet got telegraph wires and so they have to wait for the ship to bring the news. 
but these are contrabands in the crowd and black men in uniform. The bearded man next to the soldier waving his hand is Thomas Wentworth Higginson, the colonel of the 1st South Carolina Volunteers. Higginson, of course, is the Boston abolitionist who was part of the Secret Six behind John Brown. The black man holding the flag uh, next to him is uh, Prince Rivers, the color sergeant. Uh, Prince Rivers is the guy that I think of as the great story of the Civil War era and Reconstruction. But before I tell you his story and close my presentation, uh, there is something really teachable about this regarding emancipation. This is Emancipation Day, 1863. These slaves are being freed in Port Royal, South Carolina by Lincoln's proclamation. What does that mean? That means when Lincoln puts the pen to paper, thousands of slaves are actually being freed at that moment. Sometimes, you know, people like to say the proclamation doesn't free any slaves right away. It's a promise of freedom. That's mostly true, you know, four million slaves. There are tens of thousands of slaves in the Union-occupied Sea Isles and tens of thousands of slaves in places like Corinth, Mississippi that are occupied by Union troops and not exempt by the proclamation. The proclamation exempts certain areas, but not all areas that are occupied by Union troops. Areas that are occupied by Union troops and on their way toward political integration and so that was part of the process that Lincoln had defined. If they're moving towards civil authority, then we can't use a military decree to free those slaves. But the Sea Isles of South Carolina near Beaufort, they're not exempt. No part of South Carolina is exempt from the proclamation. So every slave behind Union lines in South Carolina is freed on January 1st, 1863 by that military order. There were tens of thousands of slaves in the Sea Isles who were freed by that proclamation. So Lincoln's pen does free slaves on January 1st. It's the greatest freedom moment in American history, the greatest single mass freedom moment in American history. It doesn't nearly free everybody. Most slaves remain enslaved, and they will until the end of the war. And of course, there are some who are enslaved all the way through the ratification of the 13th Amendment. But I like to use this image as a kind of eyewitness testimony to the fact that some people were freed. The emancipation moment shouldn't really be depicted with an image of Lincoln and his pen, it should be this moment right here. Now, does anybody use this image already? So it's freely available at our Emancipation Digital Classroom. It's linked through this site that I just showed you. It's all, this is a powerful thing. And if you go to the Emancipation Digital Classroom, what makes it even better is that we have about a half a dozen different first-hand accounts of this moment, written accounts from Higginson, from the doctor who was there, a surgeon in the unit, from Charlotte Fortin, who was a black abolitionist who was down there to help teach. We have some recollections, some letters, some diary entries. I want to highlight one recollection by Susie Baker King Taylor. She's a young black girl who had escaped from slavery in Savannah. She knew how to read, so they put her to work in the Sea Islands as a laundress and also as a teacher. And so she's a young black girl who is teaching black men how to read in Union-occupied Sea Islands of South Carolina. After the war, she becomes a nurse and then later publishes her recollection. She's the only black woman with direct military experience in the war who writes a published recollection. So she's a very interesting figure, and she's about the age of a lot of your students. Okay? But the man that I wanted to focus on from this picture is Prince Rivers, that guy, the color sergeant. So I think of him, like I said, as like the embodiment of this whole story in some ways. Has anybody heard of him, Prince Rivers? Raise your hand if you've taught him. Has anybody taught him? Now, a couple of people nodded their heads. How many people have heard of him? Okay, so I'm gonna make the case that everybody should teach him, and I'll make my case in five minutes and you can decide. So Prince Rivers was a slave in Beaufort, South Carolina. He had a very wealthy plantation master in the lowlands, and he was his carriage driver. And when the Union occupied the Sea Isles in late 1861, early 1862, Rivers takes advantage of that fact, steals the carriage, rides behind Union lines, and he's one of the contraband at the beginning of the war. And then um, he uh, immediately impresses the Union troops. He's literate. He's older, he's a commanding, natural-born leader. So when they start raising troops, this is David Hunter, the abolitionist general, he starts to raise a secret regiment of black men. Prince Rivers is the guy they decide to make the color sergeant. That's why Hunter has been replaced and now 
They have Rufus Saxton as the commanding general of the department and Thomas Wentworth Higginson as the colonel of the regiment. But that's why on Emancipation Day, you got Prince Rivers holding the flag as the color sergeant under Thomas Higginson's proud eye. And the illustrator depicts it and the newspaper quotes him proudly saying he will never drop these colors unless they kill him and he's going to carry these colors and show them to all the old masters. And so that's, um, that's uh, a powerful uh, moment, um, but it is not the end of the story. I mean, he becomes a hero during the war. He's like a celebrity. Higginson will later write an article about him in the Atlantic. He'll say he's got more administrative ability than any white man in my unit. And after the war, he becomes a landowner, We've got documents from him. If we go to the Emancipation Digital Classroom, we've got a whole section on his life and history. Uh, he becomes a politician in Reconstruction Era South Carolina. He becomes a trial judge. But then things turn. You know, in the 1870s, the story of Reconstruction, a story that Ann and Greg are going to sketch out a little bit more, the redemption process begins, the fight from white Southern Democrats to take back control from black Republicans and carpetbaggers and scalawags, you know, their battle in South Carolina is eventually gonna haul Prince Rivers into this maelstrom. I mean, he faces his moment of reckoning at the Hamburg Massacre, which is one of the worst episodes of violence uh, in the Reconstruction era, one of the most notorious at least. July 4th, 1876, the black militia is celebrating Independence Day uh, Prince Rivers is the head of the black militia, but he's also the trial judge. They have a parade. Some of the white residents in Hamburg don't like it. There's violence later, and then it's Rivers who's got to adjudicate this, and he tries to be even-handed. He's kind of a black conservative in some ways. He's no radical. He tries to be even-handed. He's actually angry at some of the black radical leaders who are involved in this episode, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, he tries to pursue justice. The whites in town fight him. They harass him. They persecute him, uh, and then he's driven out of his job. Uh, he loses his place in society, he loses his land, and eventually he has to take a job again as a coachman before he dies. So he dies free, but he dies employed in the same job that he had had as a slave. And that's, in some ways, the arc of Reconstruction. It's the promise and the betrayal of emancipation through the story of one figure, Prince Rivers, who's relatively obscure today, and you can tell I don't have a photograph of him yet. I have uh, an illustration of him, but I guarantee you, we're about to find the photograph. AHEC, the Army Heritage Center over at the War College, has photographs of the unit in different stages of the war. Uh, and if we could just get the right photograph and magnify it like I did with Fort Sumter, we will be able to identify him. And then I'm going to have to change my slideshow. And I'm going to have to update the panel, which we have all about Prince Rivers over in the studio. But I'll be happy to do it because you know, I want to see what he really looked like. OK, so before I conclude, does anybody have any comments or questions? Does anybody want to ask anything uh, about this early period of Reconstruction? I kind of covered the wartime or end of the war period. Um, does anybody want to ask any comments? Keisha, can you pass the microphone over to Keisha, please? Good morning, hi Matt. Um, Keisha Middleton from Philadelphia, John Bartram High School. I want to go a little further because I, have a, a little I want to go a little further. I have a difficult time teaching my students um, why it took two additional years for the slaves in Texas to be freed. So I can't find documents for that yeah. or images for that. So right. is so there anything that, available? So uh, that's a common question. But that's not the way I teach it, right? So here's how I teach it. You can decide how you want to handle this. The Emancipation Proclamation doesn't free every slave right away. Like I said, it frees tens of thousands right away. Sometimes we overlook that. But really, it's the promise of freedom for the others. And that promise has to be delivered by the Union Army taking back parts of the South. It takes two years for them to defeat the Confederacy. And even then, at the end of the war, there are large sections of the South 
that have not yet seen the Union Army. One of the things Greg Downs is about to do is he's going to show you how even after the war is over, they have to use the army in occupation to spread freedom. And he's got this map that's going to make that clear. Um, but when I teach uh, the story of Juneteenth, I teach it as a kind of folk myth. It's not that they didn't hear about emancipation. It's not that it took two years to get emancipation to Texas. It's that that's what emancipation was. It was mostly the promise of liberation as the Union Army occupied the South. And that occupation took a long time. And so I'll let Greg pick up that story when he presents next, but that's how I do it. OK, I think I have time for one more question or comment if somebody has it. Does anybody have anything that they want to bring up? Jim Schmick in the back would like to remind you, I think, that uh, you can use credit cards to buy books. But besides that, Jim, do you have a real question? And you'll come back to autograph them here, right? Yeah, OK. okay. I'll be back there to sign uh, if needed. It's, it's not really a question. I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but the Emancipation Monument. Right. The Freedmen's Monument in Washington. Yes, yes. yes Emancipation Park. That, when that was dedicated, uh, that's when Frederick Douglass made his comment about Lincoln was the white man's president. Right. And he said Grant just wanted to crawl under his chair. He couldn't believe it. There's a book I have on that. Right. So it's on the monuments in D.C. But yeah. I just wanted to add that. That's where he made the comment. Yeah, Grant was there. Members of the Supreme Court were there. It was yeah. a powerful moment. That story of the Freedmen's Monument. I don't know how many of you have been to see the Emancipation Memorial in Washington. It's the first Lincoln Memorial. It was paid for by the contributions of former slaves. Yeah. It's the first Lincoln Memorial in Washington, I should right. clarify. And it's holding the emancipation, not the, a lot of people think it's the Gettysburg Address, and it's actual emancipation yeah, proclamation. It's, it's a monument dedicated to Lincoln as the great emancipator. The Lincoln Memorial, of course, puts him in a more unionist context, not in an emancipationist context. It's got the Gettysburg Address in the second inaugural. This monument, the one that was dedicated in 1876, paid for by the former slaves, is about freedom. It's about emancipation. It's not visited today, but it should be. Like, that's the teaching moment. And as uh, Jim said, it's the, uh, the white man's president moment. And in the video, I describe all that. OK, so we're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, there's still coffee and Danish over there. And then in 15 minutes, Greg Downs is going to lead us through his session on After Appomattox. Make sure you're in your seats prompt at 1045, though, OK? Thank you.